sing that song? And, and you know, you know, it's really exciting, especially that part that said, Nobody died on the Magoni, but Jesus Christ. And then he goes, What? <laughs> His voice cracked at that very moment. But uh, it, is, uh, it is so great to be together here as family. Uh, welcome, welcome to those that are visiting with us. And uh, I do want to also say a special thank you to uh, both Joseph and Bibi for sharing the communion. Yeah. Yeah. Man, Bibi, I did not know. Bibi, I did not know your story, yeah. and uh, that was incredible just to hear your story and a little bit about your life and all that you've been through yeah. and what God has taught you. And hey, man, we're super grateful that although we don't like all the bad things that happen, we're grateful that those things happened that brought you here to church and do with us as a family. And uh, Joseph, we're very sorry about the bird. Uh, thank you for sharing your story and for contribution for us this, this afternoon as well. Let's, uh, let's open the Bible to Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. You guys ready to have some fun this afternoon? You know, right here in Jeremiah 13, verse 23, the Bible simply says, can an Ethiopian change his skin oh. or a leopard its spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Oh. Yeah, man, what a, what a way to start a sermon right here. You know, at first class, this could seem like a pretty negative scripture or a negative verse. And it, it seems to imply that people can't change. That just like an Ethiopian can't change its skin or just, just like a, a leopard cannot change its spots, so, too, people are not able to change. Now, obviously, if that were true, Jeremiah would not be preaching. And we would not be here this morning or this afternoon as disciples. You know that? And so we know absolutely, yes, people can change. That being said, there are certain aspects about our lives that are unchangeable. You know, for, for some of us, whether we're tall or short, that was outside of our control. And we can do nothing about it, amen. For some of us, whether we have hair on our head or not, for some of us, we, we can't do anything about it. It's the way we're made by the Lord. And so there are things that we can change, and there are things that we cannot change. There are things that we are, quote, unquote, or, or that are, quote, unquote, baked into our DNA. Yes, sir. And so the title of our lesson here this afternoon is, You Are What You Are. Oh, you yeah. are what you are. Come on, brother. Now, just like we have certain things that are baked into our physical DNA that will determine things like your eye color, your height, your skin color, your hair color, and, and pretty much everything about your personality, besides your character and all those things that come with Christianity, just like we have those things baked into our DNA, I believe that in a sense, we can have a spiritual makeup, but we can kind of decide what we put into our DNA. And so I'm gonna talk about several things that determine who we are in Christ, that determine who we are as disciples if we put them into practice. You are what you are, and our first point this afternoon is you are what you think. You are what you think. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 23. Come on, brother. Proverbs 23. You are what you think. Now, that might be a little scary, or it can be a little exciting. It really depends on how you think. And what you think about <laughs> Proverbs 23, verse 6. You are what you think. Come on, brother. Right here, Solomon says, Do not eat the food of the begrudging host. Do not crave his delicacies, for he is the kind of person who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten, and will waste the oh, will have wasted your compliments. You know, right here, Solomon goes, "Hey, do not eat the food of a begrudging host." Some translations say, "Do not eat the food of a stingy person." Why? Because although they're offering you their food, in their mind and in their hearts, they're thinking about how expensive the meal is, and they're thinking about all the money they've spent on you. And are sitting there seething while you eat it. And so the Bible says, although they're saying all these things, eat and drink, the reality is that their heart is not with you. Yeah. In fact, in the King James translation, 
It says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, oftentimes I think for us, we think that our actions are what determine who we are. We, we understand, I think, for the most part, that it's not our words that define us. It's, I think most of us would say, our actions that define us. Yeah, right? And you can, you can make a, an argument about that in the Bible. There's scriptures like 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20, where it says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Or Luke 6, verse 44, where it says, each tree is recognized by its own fruit. And so our, our words obviously are not enough to define us. Our actions define us more so than our words. But I think we've got to take it a step further than that. Even before your actions, your thoughts define you. The, the things that go on in your mind, the things that you think about, that's really who you are. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the word of God is alive and active. Amen? Yeah. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You go, well, why is this important? Well, if, if we understand that it's our thoughts that really define us as disciples, then we now understand that repentance has to occur not just at the action level, but even at the thought level. We have to change the way we think. And when you change the way you think, then your actions are going to change. And when you change your actions, then you change who you are. In fact, a lot of people don't understand this, but in Greek, the word repentance is the word metanio, which in Greek, meta means change. That's why we get words in English like metamorphosis. And noia means to think. And that's why we get words like paranoia, because we're, we're thinking all these different things. And so these things have to do with the mind. And so what is repentance according to the Bible? It's a changing of our mind, changing how we think. That's what a Christian does. We change the way we think. You know, there's a quote by a guy named Frank Outlaw who said, Watch your thoughts for they become words. Watch your words for they become actions. Watch your actions for they become habits. Watch your habits for they become character. Watch your character for it will become your destiny. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. How do you think? How do you think? That's hard. You really try to think about all the different kinds of thoughts that we have constantly and trying to regulate the way that we think. But it's so pivotal for us as Christians to really understand that we've got to work on the type of thoughts and the way that we think about life. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Let's go, brother. Paul says here, he says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. We don't have no nukes in the church. We don't have tomahawk missiles or cruise missiles or machine guns. He goes, those those are the weapons of the world. That's not why we fight as Christians. He goes, on the contrary, they have the divine power, our weapons, to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So that we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedient is made complete. You know, Paul can say, we don't, we don't fight in the same way that the world fights. We don't fight a physical battle. We fight a spiritual battle. And we fight that spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. And because the spiritual battle is not won at the action level. Because, no, no, the spiritual battle is won at the thought level. That you have to change your thinking. Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And when you make your thoughts obedient to Christ, you can demolish every stronghold and pretension that has set itself up against the knowledge of God. You know, I, I know that this is true for my own life. You know, I, I grew up being raised in a quote-unquote Christian environment. I was put in Christian private school. I was sent off to Christian Bible camps. And I, I really tried and thought that I was being taught how to be a Christian, and I really tried to change and be a Christian. But sadly, a lot of the people that I was surrounded by were just as wicked and just as sinful as those that I went and hung out with in the world. And so I grew up in this environment, and I got through moments or times where I really tried to change, and I would find myself back in the same place that I would always be in, and, and started to live a very worldly lifestyle. 
And so I came to the conclusion or the type of thinking where I believe that it was impossible for anyone to truly be a Christian. And so I knew religious people as just those that faked it. And they fake it a little bit better than the rest of us, but it's really impossible for anyone to really live out the Bible. And again, the reason I thought that is because all the people that I grew up around were the religious people and they weren't doing it. And I knew that I had changed or tried to change and I wasn't doing it. And so if I can't do it, if they can't do it, then nobody can really do it. Come on, brother. And I'll never forget, but my, 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 I, I'm one of four children. I have an older sister, an older brother than myself, and then my younger brother. And I, I was living a very worldly lifestyle, but I viewed my older brother as being far worse than myself. Yeah. You know, I was, I was like, okay, I'm really bad, but he's like, really bad. <laughs> That's really cool. bad. Come on, brother. And so I'll never forget, I had just graduated from high school. He was already in university. He came home for the summer. And we, we were getting lunch, and uh, I made a sandwich, and he made a sandwich, and we sat down to eat, and I'm just about to take a bite of my sandwich. And as I'm about to bite my sandwich, I look up, and I see my older brother praying for his sandwich. Let's go. And I was like, no way. I mean, remember, that this guy is like way more wicked than I am, in my mind. I mean, I'm pretty bad, but this is like next level bad. Let's go. Like, Really bad. Let's go. And all of a sudden, he's, he's praying for his food. And so I couldn't even eat my sandwich. I just sat there and stared at him. I'm just like, what is he doing? You know, and I started to think about, like, okay, what, what's going on here? I was like, what is he, what is he trying to get at here? What, what is he trying to So then he, he gets up praying. He sees me looking at him. He goes, okay, I guess, I guess you're kind of wondering why I'm praying for my food. I go, yeah, absolutely. He goes, well, actually, I mean to tell you, I've been studying the Bible with some friends that I met. And they're teaching me how to be a true Christian, a true disciple. And tomorrow I'm actually going to get baptized, and I was going to invite you to come and see my baptism. Did you want to come out and see the baptism? Like, absolutely. I, absolutely. I, yeah, I, sign me up. How do I come and see this? I've got to see this. And I was thinking, okay, what is he trying to do? Like, what is his angle? Is he trying to, like, rob the contribution plate at church? Or, like, maybe there's a girl he met at church. Like, what's, what's he doing? What's he working right here? He's doing something because there, there could not be a genuine change. Because again, I did not believe that anyone could possibly change. Come on, Evan. Let's go for that. Well, I went to church, and it was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced before. Everybody sang a cappella like we do here. Everybody <laughs> was trying to hug me like many of you experienced when you came here. And the guy that was in songs was much like Nero. He had a vein popping out of his forehead, and he was just like really going at it. I'm like, man, these guys are intense. These guys are serious. And then, like, everybody and their friends and their friends' friends and their family, everybody was asking me to study the Bible. Like, man, what is with this group? They all want me to do Bible studies. But I just came to see my brother get baptized. He got baptized, and then for two weeks, I watched everything he did. Because remember, I didn't believe that somebody could actually change. But to my surprise, he changed. He was waking up in the morning and reading his Bible. He was praying with people. He was doing Bible studies with people. All the things I found out that he actually broke up with his girlfriend that he was immoral with and moved back in with my family. And that's why he was there for the summer. I'm like, wow, he's actually changing. And, and the shock of all shocks, he was actually a nice person now. My brother was not a nice person before that. And so then it, it just kind of hit me. Well, if he can change, and he's worse than me, because I absolutely believe that, then that means that maybe it's possible that I can change. And so we were driving together, and I'll never forget this, but I, I just, we started talking, and I said, hey, Kyle, you know, my brother's name's Kyle. I said, hey, Kyle, um, do you guys, you know, you know those Bible studies that you were talking about? Do you guys still, do you guys think you can maybe, you know, like, you know, you try to make, work it in. Like, you, you think you can probably, you know, maybe try to do some Bible studies with me? And he was trying to play it cool, so he goes, yeah, I think we could probably work something out for you. <laughs> I studied the Bible. Two weeks later, I became a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I really did. You know about that? Why? Because my thinking changed. And it was amazing. When I got in the Bible, I saw why I could never change before. Because I had not done it God's way. And when you get into the Bible, that's exactly what happens. We go through the process of changing our thinking and allowing God's thinking, God's word, to become how we think. And when our thoughts change, our actions change. And when our actions change, then we become a defined uh, differently as disciples. And we become true disciples of Jesus Christ. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. 
Come on, girl. You know, recently, I got a chance to watch Inside Out 2. Oh. And I was, uh, I was a big fan of the first one. And I don't know if you guys have seen the first one. It was a really amazing, uh, amazing, very thought-provoking uh, cartoon or animation, if you will. And really, if you don't know the story, it's about this younger girl, and she's got five basic emotions. They're all represented by different characters that live inside of her mind. There's fear, anger, joy, disgust, and sadness. And the first, the first episode of the first movie is all about the interaction between these. I don't want to give it away if you haven't seen it. Uh, but it's a really awesome movie, and it's really deep if you think about what's being communicated in the movie. And so I was excited to see Inside Out too. And so we took the kids, and at this time, uh, the girl has grown up, and her name is Riley. And now her emotions have gotten a little bit more complicated. In fact, on top of fear, anger, joy, disgust, and sadness, now there are several new characters. There's anxiety, there's ennui or boredom, there's embarrassment, and now there's envy in her life. Like a true teenager, all kinds of new emotions. You with me on that? And in the main climax, again, I don't want to give too much away, but in the main climax, anxiety just goes crazy <laughs> in her mind. I mean, it's like a tornado happening in her mind. And outwardly, that's represented by a panic attack. And there's a number of different circumstances that led to all that, but, but inside of her mind, you see this tornado going on. And finally, eventually, joy is the one that stops it and kills the, the anxiety, and she gets back to a place of joy in her life. Again, I don't want to give too much away. And I'm going to admit, it, it was a very moving story, and believe it or not, there were actually a, a little, there's a little moisture that was building up. Yeah. But I was thinking about that, and I was like, you know, like, isn't that how we often are as disciples? There's, there's, there's like a control, uh, there's, there's an outward presentation we put on, but there's complete chaos on the inside. There's like a tornado happening inside. Like we try to hold ourselves together. And oftentimes we can kind of regulate our actions, but that doesn't mean that we can regulate our thinking or that our thinking is right. And I thought about that. I go, you know, what if you could turn yourself inside out? And what if we could see what you were thinking? And we could see how it lined up with what you were doing. What you think about people and how you treat people. What you think about the kingdom of God and how you conduct yourself in the kingdom of God. How you think about your discipler, or if you're discipling somebody, the person that you disciple. And how you conduct yourself in that discipling relationship. What you think about contribution and how you give. What you think about dating in the kingdom or going on kingdom dates and how you actually contain yourself or manage yourself on those in those dates or on those relationships or in those relationships. You know, it's really kind of a crazy thought, but oftentimes I think that there's a difference in how we think. And how we present ourselves. Yeah. And I believe that this is the fundamental thing that drives people away from Christianity. Because people perceive that as inauthenticity yeah. and, and, and fakeness. And there's a difference in how you think and how you present yourself. And so people get turned off because they go, well, this is just a fake group of quote-unquote Christians. I can't be won over by this. This is not real. Yeah. But when you can change the way you think and make it match up what the Bible says. And your actions match the way you think. And you authentically believe what you are saying that you believe and what you are practicing. Now you're really living it out. And you are what you are. You are what you think. Let's go to our second point. Let's go to Luke chapter 11. Let's go, bro. Come on, bro. Luke chapter 11. Point number two. You are what you see. You are what you see. Come on, brother. Point number one, you are what you think. Point number two, you are what you see. Luke chapter 11, verse 34. Three, two, Let's go for that. It says, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it is dark, it will be just as full of light as when a lamp shines its light on you. You know, right here, Jesus had just got done working this incredible miracle. And if you look at the context, he actually uh, frees this man from a demon, a demon possessing him that made the man mute. He couldn't speak because he was possessed by the spirit. And I, I believe that even as Christians, 
When we can't speak, it's because we're being unspiritual. When we're not sharing our faith, it's because there's something unspiritual happening in our life. Well, Jesus cast the demon out of the man, and the critics that were there go, Jesus did that by the power of Satan. And Jesus goes, that's ridiculous. That doesn't even make sense. Everybody knows that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so why would Satan cast out his own demon? That's stupid. He goes, look, if this is not Satan, because that doesn't make sense, then this has to be by the power of God. And then he starts talking about how they view things, how they see things. And he goes, if your eyes are full of light, then your whole body is going to be full of light. But if you're not seeing things the right way, and your eyes are full of darkness, then likewise your whole body will be full of darkness. In other words, how you see things will determine who you are as a Christian. How you see things, how you see the kingdom, how you see your brothers and sisters, how you see God's work, how you see life, that's going to determine who you are. You know, when I was in high school, uh, I don't know if they do it now, but you were forced to take driver's ed. And they had what they called vision distortion goggles. Come on, brother. And we, we, we called them beer goggles for layman's terms because that's what they were trying to simulate, is they're trying to simulate what it would be like to try to drive inebriated or drunk. And so they put these goggles on you, and it would distort your vision. You couldn't see straight. And it's truly amazing if you put those vision distortion goggles on and try to walk, how hard it is to walk when you can't see straight. And I think the same thing is true for us as Christians. When you don't see straight, you can't walk straight. Yep. Yep. And we don't see things the right way. We get, we get, uh, we get off course or we get off path on, because we're not seeing things the way that God wants us to see things. So go to the first Kings, or excuse me, the second Kings chapter 2. Let's go. Come on, brother. Second Kings chapter 2. Come on, bro. Region. You are what you see. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 1. Right here we find Elisha and Elijah's disciple relationship. And Elijah was mentoring Elisha. And this is just about the time where Elisha was about to be taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. And that's what we sang about earlier. Elijah was walking one day with a friend. And then he was taken and wasn't seen again. Yep. That, that's the story right here where Elijah is going to be taken up to heaven. And as he's about to be taken up to heaven, he has this conversation with Elisha. We'll pick it up right here in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in the whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elijah, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Let's get to verse 9. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you since I am taken from you, or before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elijah then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, divided to the right and the left, and he crossed over, the company of prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. Is that awesome right there? Yeah. Let's go. You know, right here, these two guys were walking together. And once again, Elisha knows that he's about to be taken from heaven. And so as he's mentoring Elisha, he goes, hey, what can I do for you before I'm taken up to be with God in eternity, or for eternity? And Elisha goes, well, let me, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Now, at first glance, you look at that and go, well, what, a, what a prideful, selfishly ambitious guy. <laughs> you know, he's trying to be twice as awesome as Elisha, his mentor. That's actually not what's happening right now in this passage. Elisha asked for a double portion, and a double portion was always reserved for the firstborn son in a family. And so what he's really asking is not, can I have more of your spirit? 
but can I be your son in the faith? I, I want to carry on your work. I want to carry on what you taught me. I want to do what you're doing. And so let me be your son and let me continue to do the things that you were doing with me. Come on, brother. And Elijah's response is because you, you've asked for a difficult thing. Yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. And I, I was thinking about that. And I thought, why? Why was it so important for Elisha to see Elijah being taken up to heaven? Like, why was that a requirement in order for him to receive a double portion of Elijah's spirit? And uh, I got into some commentaries and I started reading and trying to figure out the answer to that question. And uh, most commentators agree that it's probably because the chariots of fire were not visible to the naked eye. That it required a spiritual vision. That you had to see a spiritual thing happening. Yep. And so Elijah wanted to make sure that Elisha could see what he saw. That he could see the same things that he saw in relationship with God. He, he could see the world in the same way that he saw it. He could see spiritual realities the same way that Elijah saw them. And this was later confirmed in 2 Kings chapter 6. If you turn with me there. Come on, brother. In verse 15. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. You guys have to keep up with me here. <laughs> Let's go, brother. Come on, bro. It says, when the servant of the man of God, this is the king of Aram sending his troops to surround Elijah and try to kill Elijah. And the servant gets up in the morning and gets freaked out. You ever have one of those freaked out moments as a Christian? <laughs> Where you just see all the circumstances. You see all the challenges in life. You see your bank account. And you go, oh God, what are we going to do now? That's kind of the moment that's happening right here for the servant. It says he gets up in the morning and he goes outside and he says, he sees an army with horses and chariots that surround the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asks. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. You see, Elisha could see the chariots and the fire. Elisha could see the chariots of fire. But my question is, can you see the chariots of fire? You see, so often we see all the hardships, all the challenges. All the reasons why things can't work. All of the satanic lies that God tries to put in our mind. And I think for us as disciples, you are what you are. You are what you see. Are you able to see how God is working, what God is doing? Spiritual concepts being put into practice in real life. And when we don't see spiritual realities or spiritual things happening, then we cannot be spiritual beings, spiritual people. How do you see things as a Christian? You know, I think even for us, Sometimes as new Christians, we come to the kingdom, we just think everything is awesome. <laughs> wow, this is amazing. The kingdom of God is incredible. It's awesome. I mean, this is awesome singing. I love the means of the body. The preaching's awesome. And we've got a really handsome preacher, so that's really awesome as well. Uh, and everything, we just think everything is awesome. Everything's incredible. I mean, the hugs, we just excited. We get excited about every little thing. And then what happens? We get older as Christians. Uh, and familiarity breeds contempt. Right? And, and we don't see all the awesomeness of it. Now we start to see all the problems. Yeah. Well, that person like didn't give me a hug this morning when I came to church. <laughs> you know, that young Christian's talking a little bit long, too long with that guy right there. I go like, you know, that. And we start to look at all the problems. And, and then all of a sudden, the kingdom's not so awesome anymore. And our relationship with God is not so awesome anymore. And, 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 and our brothers and sisters that we once thought were incredible, and our, our best friends, isn't it amazing how people can study the Bible? with other people, in like two weeks, three weeks time, they become best friends. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And it's amazing, it's because you've never confessed your sin to people like you in the Bible studies. Yeah. You've never connected like that on that level before, yeah. and all of a sudden, just two, three weeks time, you, you're best friends, and it's genuine, it's real, you really feel that way. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, that same person that was your best friend, you look at me kind of funny today at church. <laughs> Not us. Not us, bro. I mean, I heard that she heard someone said this, that, that she heard that she said that. that she said, and then she heard a brother say that, a sister said that, a brother said that, it's another sister said that. 
Uh, what are you doing? No, we start, we start to kind of side eye each other in church. You know what I mean? You start looking at each other all different. Ah, hey, bro. How you doing that? Yeah. 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 You don't like it, you can tell. But we start, we just start getting weird. We start getting weird. Why? Because we stop seeing things in the right way. Come on, brother. This happens in our marriages too. Right? When you first date, I mean, your boyfriend, your girlfriend is perfect. Flawless. Like, we don't think anybody's perfect, but we think our boyfriends and girlfriends are perfect. It's just like God has created this one perfect person. And there, there it is. I found the one, right? True. It's like the soulmate concept, like, I found the one. Come on. We're chemically compatible. Yeah. Our hormones are like all the yeah. our, spirit, our spirits are connecting on another level. Like, this is amazing. And you go through dating and you go through engagement. Maybe you barely have a little baby fight. And you can get a, like a little baby spiritual aspirin and face that little spiritual problem. Like, it's just like a, you can think of all the fights. Right? You, you try to like, you blaze it over, you go like, oh, we had a little bump. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, was just, it wasn't a fight, it was just a little speed bump, that's all. A speed bump on the highway of love. <laughs> wow. And then you get married, and you go on your honeymoon phase, and the honeymoon's amazing, you're on vacation, you're in la-la land, and then reality hits! Oh. Oh. And now you're in each other's space. You, you see what each other looks like when you wake up in the morning. Oh! oh. I didn't know this existed. I knew there were some unsavory moments and some unspiritual moments, and you go, whoa! What happened to that perfect person I married? And then as time goes by, familiarity breeds contempt. Come on, I'm going you, bro. You know, Jesus said, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. Yeah. Yeah. But prophets and kings long to see what you see, but did not see it. Is that how you see the kingdom? Come on. Is that how you see the church? The brothers and the sisters? Or you get focused on all the drama. Oh, this brother did this, and that brother did that, and that brother did that, and that brother did that. Shut out. It's still the kingdom. It's still the kingdom. And how awesome it is. You know, I was talking to uh, our new discipling relationship, Dimitri's. I was talking to Jason. And, uh, And uh, we're talking, and he's just, uh, he's, he, he's, he just asked me a question. He goes, hey, bro, how big is your campus ministry? And so I was like, you know, I don't really know off him. And so I, I decided to go back, and I, I decided to kind of break down the church and all the demographics and try to figure out, like, what is the, what is the true makeup of our church? And it's not me. I should have done this a long time ago, but hey, man, you know, I finally come around. <laughs> and uh, it was exciting. I was able to break down the church, and I discovered that the Toronto church as a, as a whole, collectively, is made up of about 50% campus students. Is that correct? Am I right? That's good. That's awesome. In other words, our church is very young, and that's exciting because you can build every ministry through the campus ministry. Yeah. The campus students, they eventually graduate from college. I mean, eventually it happens. I know it's hard to believe, but it does happen. And then you get jobs and you become single professionals. Oh. You know what I mean? And then over time, in the single professionals ministry, you know how it is. A brother starts to like another sister. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. And, then, uh, uh, <laughs> and then, and then they get married, and now they're in the marriage ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or they don't like. Doesn't really happen. <laughs> and they end up in the mature single. Yeah. I also discovered that there are many more women in the church than men. Let me just practice this. 
The problem is not that we have too many sisters. Okay. All of our sisters are awesome. Yeah. The yeah. problem is that we do not have enough men. Yeah. 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 Straight up. Yeah. 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 And come to find out, we actually have a 70 50 split. Whoa. So 70 women to 50 brothers. Whoa. So, sisters, the dating prospects are. <laughs> Brothers, you're in good shape. You're in good shape. These, these are looking pretty up for you. Come on! But, here's the thing. Here's the thing, guys. Men are supposed to leave. The brothers are supposed to leave. Again, our sisters are incredible. They're awesome. We don't have too many sisters. We just don't have enough guys. And I think he calls us higher as brothers. We're going to step up our game a little bit right now. I also decided to break down the church by ethnicity and just kind of see what the makeup of our church is. And I was surprised. Um, and I, let me just again preface this by saying God does not care about color. God, God does not care about your race or your ethnicity. A soul is a soul. Yeah. And God puts souls in different bodies. But our bodies are different. I mean, woman, man, black, white, yellow, green, purple, blue. It doesn't matter. A soul is a soul. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. But just because God does not see race or color, does not mean that the world does not see it. Yeah. And so we need to understand that our demographic as a church needs to reflect the demographic of the city that we're a part of. Yeah. Because we're called to win those that are not in God's kingdom into God's kingdom. Well, although Toronto, believe it or not, ethnic-wise, is 50% white, the church is actually 24% white. It's 56% African Caribbean, 11% Asian, and then we're American. 7% Hispanic. Everything else. So, if you fit in one of those boxes, 2%. <laughs> why, is, why is this important? Well, I think that, see, sometimes looking at things the right way does not mean you ignore the facts. Yeah. We've got to face the facts like our brother Abraham did, but then we got to have faith to oversee the facts and to look at them in a faithful perspective or in a faithful way. Yeah, and I think this gives us a couple opportunities. Number one, is I think that for us, it gives us a chance to really work on our roles in the church, yep. men and women. Again, God has called us as brothers to lead. Now, that doesn't mean that you're more important than our sisters. It just means that there's a different role. Yeah. Likewise, God has called our sisters to be supportive of the brothers. You would know that? Yeah. Sometimes what happens when people do bad spiritually is men tend to become apathetic, and women tend to become self-righteous. Yeah. And so sometimes what will happen is the guy will stop leading, and the woman will start to lead, and the guy will let him. Yeah. That can't happen in the church if we're really going to be God's team. Yeah. You would know that? Yeah. yeah. And we've got to embrace the roles that God has given us. Amen, brothers. We got to lead. Right. Now we can also lead, use some support from the sisters in our leadership. And sometimes when the sisters get critical or when the brothers get apathetic, it doesn't help us build up God's kingdom in the way that we're called to do it. You know, imagine on a football team if the quarterback started doing all the blocking. It's not going to work for you. Or if the running back started kicking field goals. Or, or in basketball, if the center is the one who starts to dribble the ball at the court and shoot three points, that's not going to work. It doesn't work in team sports, and it doesn't work in God's team. We've got to live the role that God has called us to roll. To but I think, secondly, I think it's an opportunity for us to really go out there and boldness. I think sometimes we don't feel comfortable sharing with people that are not like us, or with people that we perceive to quote unquote have it all together. We get a little scared and go, well, they, they probably don't want what I've got, and so I'm just not going to share my faith with them. And I think we've got to we've got to grow in our boldness and really preach the word of God, understanding what this book right here represents. Yeah. Come on, bro. In Romans chapter one verse sixteen, Paul says, "I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then to the Gentiles." You know, the word power in the Greek is the word dunamis. Which is where we get our English word dynamite. Oh. This is the dynamite of God. And let me tell you, when you like this fuse, things are going to change. Yeah. 
And we have to raise up, and we've got to be willing to preach the word of God to anyone, anywhere, at any time. And I think when we truly preach the word without us seeing race or color, or without us seeing classes of wealth, or without us seeing levels of education, or without us seeing women, then we're going to truly have a demographic in the church that reflects the demographic in society around us because we've not hesitated to preach the whole word of God. You are what you think. You are what you see. And our last point, you are what you eat. Let's go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Let's go, brother. In verse 27. Here Jesus is ministering to a Samaritan. Which Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. Again, Jesus did not see gender, and he did not see race. He preached the word. She then goes back to her hometown, tells everybody she knows about Jesus, and literally the, the entire crowd, the entire town comes out to hear what Jesus has to say. We'll pick it up right here, verse 27. It says, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked him, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said he took, Could someone have brought him food? Uh, McDonald's, Tiffy's? Oh, Popeyes. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not have a saying? It's still four months to the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who draw, reaps draws a wage and harvests crop for two months. So the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus, one saying, one sows, another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you without work, for others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. You know, this woman was so blown away. She gets this entire crowd to come out to Jesus. And as they're walking towards Jesus, Jesus has this incredible interaction. With his disciples. His disciples go, hey, Rabbi, you got to get something to eat. And Jesus looks at his disciples and goes, guys, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. <laughs> Can you imagine this right here? You know, it's so cool. This past Sunday, I got a chance along with my wife and along with the Hemulas to host a celebration, a victory dinner for the winner of the first principal's class as well as the graduation class. And so we had Adam, we had KP, we had um, Colin, OG. and OG out for the winner for first principles. And then, uh, likewise, we had the two groups, the men and the women's groups that won for the Christian class. And I got to tell you, it was a meal. I mean, we literally, we, we, we barbecued some snakes on the grill. And there was, dare I say, a mountain of meat. I mean, there was so much meat. I don't think we got a picture of it, but it was incredible. It was like... The amount of meat. And then we had the barbecue chicken and we had the salad. And, you know, the salad is what you eat to, to allow yourself to uh, be okay in your conscience with eating more meat. So you just put a little bit more salad in there and then it lasts. But yeah, I feel good about eating more meat. And, and then we had rolls. I mean, it was, it was an incredible meal. Uh, asparagus, one of those things, you know, again, permission to eat more meat. And, and it, was, it was truly awesome. And uh, for all those that, that were not the winners, uh, we had food to eat that you know nothing about. Amen. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. I, I don't need to brag, but maybe it'll encourage you to work harder next time. Amen. Well, Jesus goes on, and he goes, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He goes, man, the thing that fills me up, the thing that satisfies me, the thing that I crave, you know, like that, that you crave like the awesome, Salty, chewy, soft, tender piece of meat. Some of you didn't eat lunch, so you're thinking about it. <laughs> it just like it just chews to strip. And then you pop open a Coke Zero. <laughs> and it, it almost just whispers to you. He goes, that's how I feel about 
doing the will of God. This man, I just love. I love sharing my faith. I love studying the Bible. Because that's, that's what fills me. That's my food. You know how you feel after you eat junk food? Yeah, I never get it. We had a, in university, I played college basketball. And our team, usually game day, you always go and have a team meal earlier in the day. And we would typically go to a, uh, an Italian restaurant that would feed us pasta dishes so you could get carbs and energy for the game. But that particular day, or this particular day, the restaurant was under renovations and could not do their team meal. And so we were forced to have our team meal at the school cafeteria. Now, the restaurant catered to the team and would feed us what would be good for us health-wise for the game. The school could care less about the team. And we had to adapt to whatever they were serving that night. Well, it just so happened that that night they were serving up chimichangas. Oh! Now, if you don't know what a chimichanga is, it's a burrito that's been made, pre-made, wrapped, everything like that, and then they fry the entire burrito in oil. Oh. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's delicious. It's, it's really good. Why are you eating? <laughs> well, let's just say that night it started to hit the teeth. Oh! It started to happen through all the team, and needless to say, it was not a great game at all. There was various trips to the washroom, and it was it was a horrible evening. You remember that? I mean, I don't, I'm trying not to be too blunt. I'm trying to keep it so it's like you know, you guys don't come back next week. But you know, I think in some ways we are what we eat. And I think for some of us, we can we can kind of gorge on that junk food Ooh. and fill ourselves up with that Netflix. Oh. And sure, of course, it tastes good in the moment. But a little later, you start to get the rumble in the belly. And the jungle. Or we fill ourselves up with that interest that we like. Oh, I just love her attention. Oh, I just love his attention. I just can't wait to talk to him. I just can't wait to talk to her. I just want to think about what she's thinking about. I just want to see what she's doing. I just want to know what And then it tastes so good in the moment. Come on, everyone. And then, oh, we don't feel so good anymore. Oh, 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 we start getting into impurity. Oh, I feel so good for so temporary, such a temporary period of time. And then all the guilt, all the shame comes in. And, oh, it starts to hurt the belly. And, and we don't fill ourselves up. I'm doing the will of God. Yeah, it was, it was so awesome at Men's Midweek. We got to see Daniel baptized. <laughs> and Daniel is our 40th baptism of the year. He's not excited. <laughs> and it's awesome because this time last year, that, that kind of marked our halfway point for the number of baptisms that the Lord gave us last year. Last year at this time, we had 21 baptisms. We finished the year with 42 baptisms. We already had 40 baptisms, and so if we follow the same trend that we had last year, we can see another 40 baptized in Christ. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you know, as, as awesome as it has been to see God working in the church, and I think that a lot of us have had a great spiritual diet where we've been all about the work of God, and that's, that's incredible. But let's be honest, there's been some of us that have been filling ourselves up with the chimichangas. <laughs> the spiritual chimichangas. And, and we're not, we're not, you know, you know you're, you're eating the chimichangas when you're just out fired up about being at church. Yeah. Right? And you can tell those who are eating the chimichangas because they come here and they're not fired up to sing and they're not fired up about the relationship with God and they're not fired up to be with disciples and they're not fired up to read their Bible and I have quiet times. Yeah. Chimichangas! Man, does it taste good for a moment? But oh, it starts to hurt. Later on. You know, I remember when we first moved to Toronto, we were being sent out of Los Angeles in 2017. And uh, there was just a small number of us, and there was a small group here left. And uh, we, were, we were getting ready to go uh, leave for, uh, for Toronto. And there was a brother named Quaker Sarkonia who now leaves a church in Johannesburg, South Africa. And he came up to me, and we were talking, going back and forth, and he goes, hey, bro, what's your, what's your plan for Toronto? And I go, you know, honestly, bro, Toronto's a cranking city. And they have the University of Toronto, and it's like top 20 in the world. Or college. So my plan is I'm going to go after U of T, and we're going to go ahead and just baptize U of T. It's going to be awesome. Come on, U of T. 
Let's go. And he goes, oh, okay. Bro, are you sure that you don't want to like go to some of the other colleges that are not so prestigious and not so hard like U of T first? You know, Jesus went to Judea and Galilee before he took out Jerusalem. And I go, no, we're going <laughs> straight for Jerusalem. We're going straight for Jerusalem. Let's go, brother. Well, we got here, and you know, we, we started our ministry at U of T, and at first we baptized. In fact, the U of T ministry grew to about 12 or 13, yeah. and then in one summer, they literally all fell <laughs> Out of here. Wait, who was right? So, okay, you know we're going to switch things up. We stopped ministering at UT. We're going, this isn't good. And we started a ministry at York University, and we eventually we had our York yeah. University group, and the TMU group, and the TMU group. Yeah, we got a group from TMU, we played the George Brown Let's College. Go. And then we sent a group to Hummer College and Seneca College. And the plan was that this summer we were going to plant another region, the Durham region. And the Durham region has Centennial College, Durham College, Trent University, and some other universities as well. Well, circumstances changed, and, you know, the door kind of closed to Durham region. But, you know, sometimes when God closes one door, he opens up another door. Hey! So I was thinking, okay, we're not going to plant Durham this summer. What, what can we do? And all of a sudden, as I'm looking at the map of Toronto, U of T is just staring at me like a giant eyeball. I, yeah. I go, I think God's calling us to go back to U of T. Yeah. So here in Central Region, by the end of this year, we are going to plant another campus ministry at the University of Toronto, which is one second in the world at the University. I think that'd be so. What's it going to take? We've got to have a steady diet yeah. of doing God's will. Yeah. You can't fill yourself up with the chicken chocolates of the ministry. Yeah. Spiritual chicken chocolates. They're just not good for your spiritual. They taste good, yes. But man, do they hurt later on down the road. Yeah. And I think that for us, we've got to fill ourselves up. We've got to enjoy sharing our faith inside the Bible with people. Yeah. We've got to let that satisfy us. And sometimes it's hard. You know how it is when you eat healthy food, and sometimes it's not good. The most tasty things. And sure, you got to experience rejection. Sure, you got to experience persecution. Sure, you got to experience opposition and hardship and all those things. Amen. But man, does it make you feel satisfied yeah. at the end of the day? Yes. You know, at the end of the day, in Jeremiah 13, 23, can an Ethiopian change his skin or a leopard in spots? Can we change our hairstyle? Yes, but can we change whether or not we have hair? No. no. Can we change our eye color? Can we change our height? No, we cannot. There are certain things about us that are just baked into our DNA. And likewise, there are certain things that, for us, make up our spiritual makeup. Yeah. You are what you are. You are what you think. You are what you see. You are what you eat. And so let's see the right things. Let's think the right way. And let's make sure that we fill ourselves up with the right diet. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Yeah.